Good morning. Welcome to our morning worship, coming to you from Shankill Baptist Church in Belfast. We do welcome you in the Lord's name, whoever you are, and wherever you're listening from, we trust that this service will be a blessing to you today. We're delighted to welcome as our guest preacher this morning, Pastor Jim McGill, pastor of the Dromore Baptist Church. And we trust and pray that the Lord will bless him and bless us through his ministry at this time. The evening service is at 7 o'clock, preceded by a season of prayer at half past six. And Pastor McGill will be the guest preacher at our evening service. Wednesday night is church night. Half past seven, we meet for praise, for the reading and the study of God's word, and for prayer. A very important meeting in the life and witness of our church. And we ask you to make church night a priority in your weekly program. Do come along. You will be blessed uh, if you come. The service is next Lord's Day, 11 in the morning and 7 in the evening. Our morning service here is concluded with the remembrance of the Lord in the breaking of bread. And if you know and love the Savior, he invites you and instructs you to remember him in this, his own appointed way. We come to worship God this morning. Let's hear his word as we read it from Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. We worship God as we sing to his praise the words of this great hymn, Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. together 
in prayer. Let us all pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to meet in your house and to lift our praise and our worship and our thanksgiving to you, our great God and loving Heavenly Father. We come in our Saviour's name. There is no other name. We come through the merits of his atoning sacrifice. There is no other sacrifice. We come thankful for that new and living way that you've opened unto us, whereby we who once were far from God can draw near. We thank you for this your day, the first day of the week, the privilege and opportunity to meet in your house, to hear your word, to remember your Son, our Saviour, in your divinely appointed way. What an awesome privilege to be in your holy presence. What an honor to worship you, the Lord God Almighty. Grant to all of us the help of the Holy Spirit so that in our praise and in our worship Christ may have the preeminence. That the words that we speak, the thoughts that we have may be spirit-controlled and God glorify it. Help us to think about what we have been singing and what we will sing. And as we remember you in the breaking of bread, draw graciously near. Remove from our hearts and minds every distracting, disturbing thought, the feelings of the past, the fear of the future. And while we're here speaking to all our lives in such a way, that we may become more and more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Hear this, our prayer, and bless us as we continue to worship you this morning. For Jesus' sake, amen. In a moment or two, we're going to come to God in our intercessory prayer. But before we do that, let's sing this great hymn, Before the throne of God above, I have a strong a perfect plea.
Father, we thank you for the confidence that these words bring to our hearts this morning. We bless you that in your word we're invited to come to your throne, the throne of grace. And at that throne we are promised mercy and grace to help us in all our time of need. We bless you this morning for the gift of life. We thank you for the measure of health and strength that we enjoy, food to eat, clothes to wear, the warmth and comfort of our home, the joy and blessing of family life. But most of all, we thank you for sins forgiven, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that in your presence, we can find fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You are a faithful God. And for the measure in which we have experienced that faithfulness, we thank you. Even when we are faithless, you remain faithful. And we praise you for that. We thank you for your blessings upon us since we last met together. You are the God who meets our need. You are the God who is faithful to every promise that he has made. And we do not take these promises for granted, but we acknowledge in them the goodness and the kindness and the patience of our God. We pray that you'll bless every head bowed before you this morning, every home, every family represented in our congregation. And our Father, we think of families that have come through difficulties in recent days and weeks and months. For those who have lost loved ones, some of recent times, Lord, draw graciously near to them. May they know that the Lord is with them. May they cast themselves upon the Lord proving that his grace is sufficient, no matter what the day may bring. We pray for the witness of this church here and the community in which you have placed us. We realize that there are multitudes around us today without any thought of God, no interest in spiritual things, no desire for the house of God. Lord, have mercy upon them. We thank you this morning that there's mercy with the Lord. And in God we have one whose grace is greater than all our sin. Father, we want to pray for our province, for our nation, for our world. A world that seems to reel from one crisis to another. Our hearts would fail us for fear if it were not for the truth that the Lord God omnipotent reigneth, that he is on the throne, and he works all things after the counsel of his own good and perfect will. Remember those who are laid aside today, some struggling physically and emotionally, some struggling spiritually, Lord, maybe here in your house this morning. May there be that word in season. We thank you for the sweet remembrance of the Lord, for the blessing of being able to gather around this table and to think again of our Lord Jesus and his dying and undying love. And as your servant comes in a few moments to bring your word, we pray that you will speak not only to him but through him. And may we have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Lord has for us. We thank you for him. We thank you for his faithful ministry in our Dremore Church. And we pray that you'll continue to bless him and use him and his wife. Pray for his family today, that you will bless them also. So, Father, we look to you. We thank you for the freedom that we have been given to meet in this way. Bless all who will 
listen to your word today within the context of this building and on YouTube, Lord. We pray that you will bless your word wherever it goes. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will ascribe all the honor and all the praise and all the glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As I've already intimated, it's a real joy for me to welcome my brother, colleague, Pastor Jim McGill from Tremor. And after we sing our next hymn, Jim is going to come and read to us from God's Word and bring the word that the Lord has laid upon his heart for this occasion. Let's stand and sing these lovely words. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after thee. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. It is indeed a great joy to have opportunity to minister from the Word of God here in Shankill Baptist today. We trust that the good Lord will bless and use his Word and encourage and challenge us through it, even as we commit it to him uh, and seek a movement of the Spirit upon it. And to that end, I want to read to you from one of the Psalms. It's a blessed Psalm that we find in the Psalm 27, and it is, of course, a Psalm of David. And this is what the Word of God would say to us and what the God of the Word would say to us here uh, this morning. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, on this I am confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me, and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And we know that the amen of God's spirit is always upon the public reading of God's word. I'll never forget that day. And the great lesson that God delivered to me through my child, a lesson that was so very simple and yet so very profound for we who are in Christ and who are facing various issues and struggles in the journey of life, issues and struggles that threaten to crush us and to overwhelm us. She was only about three or four years old at that time, and I find that incredible because she graduated from university just a week or so ago. But she was only three or four then, and as she was playing on the garage floor, I was pacing up and down and walking to and fro uh, the way that I do whenever I'm troubled and perplexed about something and wondering what to do and perhaps feel agitated or afraid. And as I was strolling back and forth, this little voice said, what's wrong, Daddy? As she could sense a, a tension. And I replied somewhat dismissively. I replied, oh, pet, I'm carrying the problems of the world on my shoulders. To which my child and her innocence and her infancy said, But sure, Daddy, is that not God's job? Well, friends, I have to tell you that in that moment I felt, yes, slightly rebuked. uh, But with that and beyond that, I also felt massively relieved. As out of the mouth of that babe and suckling God and his goodness had reminded me, and I say it respectfully, that it was his job that I was trying to do. And it was my job to carry the weight of my word to him that he might carry me through. And that we who are believers, whenever we we feel burdened and beset by the pressures and the problems of life, are to do as 1 Peter 5 tells us to do. As there it says, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. And that's what we're to do whenever we feel the weight of the world upon us. And that child was so very right that day whenever she said, but sure, Daddy, is that not God's job? Today, as we look at this wonderful Psalm 27, a psalm in which we see that David's not trying to do God's job for him, that in the face of the problems and the issues that are troubling him so, that he's not pacing up and down, but rather he's on his bended knees before Almighty God, calling out to the Lord and casting his cares and the weight of his world upon him and asking God that God might carry him through. And in doing so, he gives us a great example to follow as he records what he 
does and how he feels in this tremendous text. Psalms are so very precious, aren't they? And uh, so many of us can, can and do turn to them whenever life is fraught with difficulty and discouragement. And uh, we feel that we're carrying the weight of the world upon our shoulders. And they're just so very full of not only comfort, but also with comfort. They're so very full of counsel for us, for as and when things are tight and tough in life. And Psalm 27 is no exception. Psalm 27 is true to that. And if you're wrestling your way through some issues, some trials that are stretching you, and maybe you're struggling at present, well, surely God has something to say to you as we take up in this text for this morning. Psalm 27 is, of course, as I've already said, a psalm of David. And uh, albeit we, we don't know the exact context, it's likely that it was whenever Saul and others were coming hard against him, they were threatening his life, they were slandering his character, they were pursuing him relentlessly. And everything in life seems to be against him, and every turn he makes and everywhere he goes, it seems as if there is no relief. And David, in the midst of this great instability and uncertainty of life as it stands, as a man of faith, as the man who is after God's own heart, he turns to the only one who can help, the only one who can give hope when the weight of this world is against you and all seems helpless and hopeless. And that is, of course, the Lord. And here we read of him doing that. And as we do so, I want us to ponder what he said and how and why he said it, that we might get the good of it for as and when and should we face troubling things in our lives. And the first thing I want us to ponder to that end is that here we can see that David rejoices in the presence of God. David rejoices in the presence of God. As the psalmist is beset with difficulty, as hard things And harsh people come against him, seeking to harm him, to slander him. And he feels the mental and the emotional and the physical and the spiritual strain of these things. With all that in mind, he is yet mindful and thankful of the fact that God is with him. And that he can say what he says elsewhere. He can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Friends, I want to tell you, it's great to know that the Lord is with you. That the Lord is on your side. And indeed that the Lord is by your side. Whenever things are tight and life is fraught with trouble and toil of one sort and another, as it so often can be in this fallen world in which we live. But what a wonderful thing it is to be conscious and to be confident of the fact that God is with us and watches over us, whatever we face and however dark things may be. You know, there was another little girl I used to know when she's a a young woman now and a young mother now, But whenever she too was about four or five, she was diagnosed with cancer and uh, she had to go through all sorts of things by way of her treatment. And uh, I'll never forget visiting her parents and them showing me a a little page that they had found under her pillow on which were written these words. I will not be afraid of the dark because I know God is with me. I will not be afraid of the dark for I know God is with me. Isn't that wonderful? And isn't it great to be able to say such? And we who are Christians, we can say such, for God has told us in his words that however dark things may be in life, that he is our light and salvation, and that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that he's right there with us, whether we see him, or whether we sense him or not. A man and his wife were once visiting a church, and before the service began, the wife gave her husband a a bit of a nudge, and she said to him, why does that poster up on the wall say, God is nowhere? It doesn't say, God is nowhere, said the husband. It's just the angle that you're looking at. It says, God is now here. You know, friends, sometimes in the darkness we can think that God is nowhere. 
But that's just the angle that we're coming from. He is right there with us and he cannot not be. He's right there with you if you're passing through a dark valley at present. David knew that. And despite the difficulty that's upon him, he looks to God as his light and salvation knowing that God is there, that God does care, and he overrides the fears that he has with the faith that he has in the presence of the Lord. And he says, whom shall I fear? In verse 1, he says, the Lord is my strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Verse 3, he says, my heart shall not fear, though war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. I am not afraid of the dark because I know God is with me. And so we need to be consumed with the idea of the presence of God when, it come, when trouble comes our way, denying doubt and applying faith that we might have David-like confidence in the face of whatever it is we have to face, whatever might be frightening us and threatening us in the journey of life. But in pondering this psalm, as we have thought about the fact that David is confident of the Lord's presence and looks to him as his light and salvation, let's also ponder the fact that not only does David rejoice in the presence of the Lord, but with that he also resolves to honor the Lord. He resolves to honor the Lord. In verse 4, he tells us that it's his desire to dwell in the house of the Lord and to behold his beauty. In other words, he's determined to stay true to God and to focus on him and honor him, come what may. In verse 6, he speaks of, of rising above his enemies and delighting in God, whatever his difficulties, as he offers sacrifice and service to him. Yes, even with and through those difficulties as his desire and determination to stay true to God, rejoicing in him and praising him, come what may, is paramount. And his difficulties in life will not deflect him from doing as the Lord calls us to do in Matthew 6 and 33, where he says that we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's what David is doing. And this is why David can yet speak of joy in verse 6. Even though his life is fraught with pain and difficulty, he yet worships God and rejoices in him. Philippians 4, we're called to rejoice in the Lord always. Yes, even in the hard days. And David does. Because David is looking to and sheltering in and determining to worship and honor him whatever trouble they may, there may be. And friends, the same can be true for us too. For as and when we meet tough things in life and determine to look to the Lord and to honour him through them by refusing to have them to deflect us from putting first things first. And as with the psalmist of old, whatever our mitigating circumstances might be, we must prioritise or walk with God and seek to praise him regardless of of those trials that are upon us, and indeed through the trials that are upon us, as oftentimes the problems and predicaments of life give us the greater opportunity not only to grow in our faith, but also to glow in it to the glory of God as well, as we honour him in remaining faithful to him. And oftentimes, that's why he allows us to meet adversity and affliction that we might grow and glow for him through them. It may be a bit like that uh, jeweler who'll, who'll set a, a gem against a dark background, a black velvet cloth or whatever, in order to highlight its value and its beauty. And God in his sovereignty, he can permit dark things to enter into our lives that we might shine all the more through them for him, be it health problems or be it being put down and persecuted for our faith, or be it facing things that are unfair and unjust, or be it people trouble, or, or be it money trouble, or family trouble, or social or mental issues. None of us want to meet these things. But the thing is, if we do, or maybe it's better phrased as we do, if you determine to honor God through them, then those very obstacles can become opportunities to shine for God and to show forth his glory. 
And with that, to grow not only in our witness for him, but also in our walk with him. Someone has suggested that our tough times in life do one of two things. They either make you a better Christian or a bitter Christian. Sometimes some folk can fall into the trap of despising their trials and even blame God and they become all embittered within about that. But whenever you accept them and you seek to employ them for his glory and you say with David, the Lord is my light and my salvation, verse 6, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy and his tabernacle I will sing, yes I will sing praises to God regardless of my difficulties, then the benefits will be mighty and the blessings will be great. And the challenge to you and I today, if we're under the cosh, is to do a David and to determine to honour the Lord as you carry that load. Third thing here is that as David rejoices in the presence of the Lord and resolves to honour the Lord, he also remembers to pray to the Lord. He remembers to pray to the Lord. Verse 7 and the verses thereafter, the psalmist stops speaking about the Lord and he starts speaking to the Lord and asking him for help and for hope in the face of the hardships that are upon him. For albeit he, he knows by faith that God is with him and for him as these enemies come hard against him, he yet realizes the urgency and the necessity of prayer and he doesn't take the Lord and his presence for granted, even praying that God won't leave him nor forsake him as he wrestles with his difficulties. You know, friends, it's a simple but vital truth that prayer is altogether pivotal for us for as and when we're struggling in life. As rather than carrying the, the weight of the world on our shoulders, we're to carry ourselves to God and we're to cast our burden upon him for, and I say it reverently, that's his job. And that's what he would have us to do. And that's what he calls us to do. As we're to prayerfully seek his face and favor as and when we feel threatened and frightened and anxious about the issues of life. Now that might sound very simple. It might sound too simple. But yet it has to be said. For sometimes we can become so embroiled, so engrossed in the things that are troubling us that we can forget and we can neglect prayer and we can merely go through the motions and we can be guilty of offering lip service to God uh, and there can be a want of true prayer and as a consequence of that there's a loss of spiritual power and of spiritual perspective and with that spiritual peace and we can be all the more anxious and all the more afraid and fraught with instability. And in borrowing from James chapter 4 verse 2, it can become a case of you do not receive because you ask not and you ask receive not because you ask amiss. We need to pray over our problems and predicaments. Genuinely pray. As with David in this psalm. Not just praying for the removal of the problem. And it's okay to do that of course but more so praying for the will of God to be served, for the glory of God to be known, for the grace of God to be granted, that his strength might be made perfect in our weakness. And you know, folks, I do honestly believe that if there was a lot more praying, there'd be a lot less spreading. So you give yourself to prayer. You make it your first resort rather than your last resort. Make it your steering wheel rather than your spare wheel. And God's ear will be open and God's blessing will be sure. David remembered his need to pray to the Lord in the light of his dilemma. And so too must we. One final thing before we close. And that is that David retains his belief in the providence of God. He rejoices in the presence of God. He resolves to honor God. He remembers to pray to God. And he retains his trust in the providence of God. As in bringing this psalm to a close, he writes in verse 13 of not losing heart 
because he believes that the goodness of God will prevail over whatever the hardships of life may be. And therefore, as he says in the final verse, verse 14, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. David believed that God has a plan and a purpose for his predicament. And that he means it for good. He believes in the God of Romans 8 and 28. You're familiar with that verse, of course, aren't you? It's wonderful when it says that we know that all things work together for good for those that love God and who are called according to his purpose. All things, even the awkward and the awful things in life, are ultimately meant for good for we who are God's people. See, that's a wonderful truth to have and to hold. And I know that whenever I've been struggling in life, that's the one truth that has kept me sane at times whenever everything else in life has seemed to be insane. God has a higher purpose for that bad thing. And I think this was true of David too. And that's why he says what he says in verse 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of of the living. It was Dr. James Dobson who once said that God makes sense even when he doesn't make sense. And you can trust him even though you can't track him. And that's what we're to do. When life is upside down, when life is inside out and the wrong way round, we're to trust him. We're to believe in his higher providence. And we're to wait on the Lord. And so, friend, as you listen in on camera or as you listen in in the church here, let me say that if you're struggling presently, as things seem to be against you, remember that God is for you. Remember that he wants you to do a David. And rather than trying to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, you're to look to the Lord, rejoicing in his presence, resolving to honor him, Remembering to make prayer to him and retaining your belief in his higher providence. Waiting on him by faith in the knowledge that he's the Lord your shepherd and you shall not want. May you do that and may God bless you and grace you to do that. And may he minister to you by his word this day as we commit these things to the care of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' most precious name. Let's just offer a prayer before we sing. Seek God's face in favor. Eternal one, we thank you for the treasure trove that is this psalm. We praise you for the experience of David as he has recorded it for us here, led of the Holy Spirit to do so. And we pray that we would draw upon these vital lessons. We know that we live in a fallen world, Lord. And Father, we need your grace every day. We ask you, Father, to help us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in all things. And Lord, whenever life is fraught with difficulty and despair, help us to look up, Lord, and to gain strength from on high. So bless us now as we yield the word to you and as we ask that you would speak on through it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to sing. Uh, her closing hymn just now, and it's a wonderful hymn, King of Kings, Majesty, God of Heaven Living in Me.
come together to remember the Lord in his own appointed way, I want to share with you uh, one little verse. It's a very well-known verse that we find in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and this is profound. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. We collect our thoughts around the table today as it reminds us of Mount Calvary. I want us to centre them on this powerful verse that we have read together from 1 Peter 3 as it really captures and conveys something of the immensity of God's love toward us in Christ in just a few words. And I want to point out a number of abiding truths that are brought to light through it as it speaks to us of Christ's sacrifice upon that cross. And the first of these is that Christ's death was unique. Christ's death was unique. Peter writes and says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. The Saviour's death upon the cross was a once for all unique event, never to be repeated. There are those who will blasphemously claim to offer up a fresh sacrifice every time they celebrate their communion. But the Bible tells us that the bread and wine are to remember that one perfect sacrifice that Christ made and that Christ was. Whereas Hebrews 10 and 12 tells us, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. You see, only one perfect sacrifice was necessary and needful. And when Jesus cried, it is finished upon that cross, it was finished. And all that was needful for our redemption had been experienced and endured by him on the cross. And this was an altogether unique event. But you know, Christ's death on the cross wasn't only unique, it was also undeserved. And Peter tells us this, As he writes here, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. The just for the unjust. Christ was just. Christ was pure and blameless and stainless and undeserving of the punishment that he had received and the death that he embraced as he bore our sins upon that tree. The just for the unjust as he was slain for us. Friends, does that not stir your heart and soul and at the same time make you bow your head in shame as you think on what he had to pass through for the sake of your sin and mine as he who knew no sin was made sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him? What love, what marvellous, matchless love. But you know, for by his death being unique and undeserved, we can also conclude by saying that the consequences of his death are unending. The consequences of his death are unending. You see, because Christ has tasted death for us, and because he has risen from death and conquered it for us, and brought us on to God, we will live forevermore. Jesus said, He that believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Brothers and sisters, although the wages of sin are death, the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, by the grace and goodness of God, have received that gift. We have eternal life. We have it because of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And how we need to think on the wonder of that. And how we need to thank the one who bore our sins and sorrows For the greatness of this salvation which has been imputed to us. And we'll do just that now as we come together shortly in order to celebrate his love through this bread and wine and return our thanks to him for suffering once for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might give us life everlasting. We're going to sing a hymn before we do that and it's a wonderful hymn. It reminds us of that one sacrifice of sins forever. It's that beautiful hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love for us. 
Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. partake of this bread and this wine that speaks to us of the blood and the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and we thank the Lord uh, for the opportunity to do just this and for the wonder it is to be saved and to remember the Lord in his own appointed way and so let us first of all offer prayer to God just now eternal father we thank you for the wonder of this one sacrifice for sins forever as your Son gave himself the just for the unjust, that we might live eternally through him. We know, Father, that we're worthy of nothing from you except your judgment, and yet you have lavished your love upon us, each one, in giving Christ to the cross. We praise you that you have brought many sons to glory, and we thank you that we are numbered with that multitude. So receive our thanks and praise just now as we partake of this bread and this wine, in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank the Lord, first of all, and partake of this bread symbolic of his son's broken body. Let us do so just now.
scriptures tell us that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We thank the Lord for that shed blood, and we now partake of this wine that speaks to us of it. Father, we thank you for the richness of these moments when we can remember your Son in his own appointed way. We thank you, Father, for the salvation so great, so free. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless us in our meditation uh, on these things, Lord. And Father, that from that you will equip us and enable us to be the people that you desire us to be. So bless us now, Lord, and be with us each and all as we depart this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me thank you for your attendance today, virtual or otherwise. We trust that the word of God will enrich your soul and that you will know its blessing and challenge to you. And so we say thank you once again, and we thank God most of all for his goodness in permitting us to worship him in this way. Mm -hmm.